ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the, went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of fir wood, on harps, on string instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and all cymbals, and on cymbals. And when they came to Nashon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there on his error. And he died there by the ark of God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. I'm going somewhere with this. Verse 9 says, David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David. But David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Verse 12, it says, Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. Quickly, the name Uzzah means strength. What have we been doing in our own strength to try to worship the Lord? Has he ordained what you're doing? And then when the Lord shuts it down, we get up in arms and say, Lord, how, how can we do this? But the man of God, King David, called a revelation. He had to see that the house where the ark rested was blessed. And King David said, nah, man, let me get this together. Let me get this ark because it belongs in the city of David. And so whatever has been impacting your worship, it's time to let it go. Every other that has arisen in your life, it's time to be set free from it. Because the ark of God belongs in your house. It belongs in your city. It belongs within your gates. And so with that in mind, we're going to give the Lord praise. Let's talk to God in the unknown tongue. Father, we give you praise because this is an hour that you have ordained for us to meet with you. Father, we thank you because your word declares that you inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, you come to sit in the praises of your people. You come to dwell in the midst of your people. For your word declares that where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Father, we know that you are here. We know by faith that you are here. Oh God, begin to touch our hearts, creating us clean hearts and renew right spirits within us. Oh God, we declare that we will worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we thank you that heaven is open over this place, that your angels are going to and fro, ministering to our hearts. Lord, we thank you because you tune us up to the frequency of heaven. Father, we know that it's a privilege to be in your presence. We declare today that we'll labor for your feet. We'll love on you, O God. For your word declares that one moment in your presence, one moment in your courts, O God, is better than a thousand anywhere else. Now let's take about 30 seconds. Just turn yourself up in the spirit. Turn yourself up in the spirit. Just 
spirit have a home here tonight. Let your spirit have a home here tonight. Let your presence dwell in our praises tonight. Oh, we, we lift our voices. Praises to Jesus. He's here to meet you this evening. He's here to meet you this evening. He's here to meet you this evening. Are you welcoming him? It's not an emotion thing. Oh, it's a willingness thing. It's authenticity no matter how quiet, no matter how loud, no matter how flamboyant. We're here for you, Father. We're here for you, Father. Yes, in amen. One more time. 
is a yes and amen. Come on. Let out a shout if you know that's the truth tonight. Come on. His promises are yes and amen. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Our God of accomplishment. Our God of achievement through action. More than words, amen. Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, he's worth sitting in a moment. He's worth sitting in a moment. God speaks in a still, quiet voice. He'll respond to the same. More than a shout of declaration and what's in your heart, he'll respond to it.
break my vows Is it a song I sing? Then you said every melody Oh, tell me what moves you Tell me what moves you Is it a fragrance? Is it a fragrance? Then I'll pour my oil out Is it a life laid down? Then here I make my vows Is it a song I sing? Then here I say Tell me what moves you I just want to move your heart It's all I want to do I just want to stand in awe And pour my love on you No matter how much the cost I'll freely give it all to you All to you, Father I just want to move Folks, as we as we get into this next song, all of what is available for you in your father's presence, I want you to go for it. So this is what the Lord was ministering to my heart as we were in that second song saying, I just want to move your heart. I want all of you. I saw people, and I know there are people that are in here, some of the people in here. And your thought as that song was going on was, man, I would love to really enjoy God's presence. I want to really, you know, I'm not, I'm not feeling like I'm connected. I'm not feeling like, I mean, I see somebody here on the stage crying, and I, I just I'm just not feeling that. And the Lord said to let you know that the way to do it is to ask for it. So whatever you're not feeling is not the problem. Just describe to him how exactly you want to be in his presence. If you want your eyes to open while worship is on, for you to see what he is doing, just ask him. I say, Lord, let me see. If you just want to be able to feel and engage him, and this is not about feelings, but I'm talking about having an experience of his presence. If you want to experience him differently, just ask him. And say, Lord, as we're going into this next song, I want to, I want to experience your presence in this place. I want, I want to recognize deeply within me that which you are doing because you are here you are here you are here and I want to experience your touch it can be that simple just ask him I say Lord I want to experience your touch I want to experience your touch I want my heart to focus on you I don't want my thoughts being random at this time I want to focus on you so just ask him how exactly you want to experience his presence as this next song come al comes along. The Bible says we have not because we ask not. And so all you need to do is just to ask to experience him differently. <laughs> good. Father, we thank you. Steve-O, you may carry on. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
know what you bought us with. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Say that one more time. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in my Savior's love. Through the storm, He is my Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. Every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within the veil Christ alone Trust in His righteousness alone. Faultless, faultless, I stand before that throne. Cause Christ, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Father, because every word of yours is the truth. And you said in your word that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, Father, we know that you are here. You have promised us your presence. And in your presence also there is liberty. There is freedom. When we come to your presence, every weight of discomfort needs to fall away when we come into your presence 
every weight of the disappointments that we have experienced in life should fall away because there is joy unspeakable in your presence. Father, we give you praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So just before we're seated, hallelujah. I'm just so thankful to God because after the Holy Spirit said to me, that people just need to ask exactly what they want their experience to be. The next thing I saw was several people kneeling down against their seats. And the entire time I was here, my eyes were shut. So I stepped down to pick up my Bible. And I can see that in fact, several people are kneeling against their seats. And so I know for, for a shorty that what we're experiencing in this place is a call to intimacy. Wherein God is calling us. To experience his presence in a corporate atmosphere like this but then also able to take it with us so that in your car you're experiencing the closeness of the Holy Spirit to you when you get to your home you will pray very freely how many people want to pray even more freely we're in prayer or being able to pray is kind of like on cruise control for you you just find yourself like mouthing stuff you know, I know we go through seasons. Several seasons are there wherein it's almost just, it's just so difficult to pray. You want to get in God's presence, but you're just not pressing in. It feels like the heavens have, have gone even higher, you know, and you can't experience that affection. You can't experience the tangibility of his presence. I want to tell you today the season that we're in. We're in a season wherein the heavens have never been closer to earth. A season where in prayer has never been easier to say. So if you haven't pressed fully into that season, just say, Lord, draw me after you and let us run together. Say, Lord, draw me after you and let us move together. That was a song that we used to sing when we were children. We used to sing that song. Draw me after you and let us run together. I will rejoice in you and be glad. I mean, it's impossible for you to be moving with the king of glory and not have joy. Because when God is on the move, nothing stops him. The Bible says, lift up your head, O ye gates. Thank you, guys. And be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And let the king of glory come in. So we're going to read a couple of scriptures today. And we're going to do a brief exercise. I'm not going to tell you what it is just yet. But let us go to the book of Nehemiah. We're going to read from the book of Nehemiah. Ne Nehemiah sounds like one of those books that should be at the end of the Bible, but is actually closer to the beginning of the Bible. So we're going to read from Nehemiah chapter 7 today. If you're having trouble finding it, it's on page 627. That, that is if you have my Bible, of course. All righty. Look at what it says in verse 7. I mean in verse 1. The Bible says, Then it was when the wall was built... And I had hung the doors when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, that I gave the charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. I only said to them, do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they stand guard, let them shut and bar the door, doors and appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one at his watch station and another in front of his own house. This was after the glory had been restored to Jerusalem. Now, for those of you that are not totally familiar with the story, uh, the children of God had been taken captive and what happened was the enemy that took them captive took the very best of them to serve the kingdom of the oppressors. But the man by the name of Nehemiah received favor from the Lord and was instructed to see to the restoration of the walls of Jerusalem, the walls that had been broken. Now, before getting too deep into the teaching, I'm going to skip like two or three steps to what we need to pray about. What we have just read here is the story of our salvation. Okay, because remember that the Old Testament was all about God 
trying to tell the story of his love for us, but recognizing that we were still so very behind. And so he allowed for certain things to happen in the natural that were a shadow of what is to come. Okay, like when Moses, God raised Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of captivity and their deliverance was a physical deliverance. They were literally taken by the hand of the angel of the Lord and brought to the Red Sea. And when they got to the Red Sea, the sea opened. They saw physical armies chasing behind them. But in reality, all of that experience was to give us a shadow of what would happen when Jesus comes. And Jesus was said to be a prophet like Moses. So when Jesus came, what he did was he took us out of the world system. He took us out of Egypt and led us on a journey of appreciating and recognizing the love of God. Okay, so that is the story of the Old Testament. Everything you see in the Old is essentially telling you a tale about the work that Jesus is coming to do. All right? So here is another one of those stories. Nehemiah was saying, I was the one that was sent by God. And I have seen to the restoration. All I am asking you to do is guard the door. All I am asking you to do is secure what I've already done. The same story is the story of today's believer. You did not have to bleed and be crucified for your sins. Jesus did that. And he's saying, after having restored all things, I just want you to guard your righteousness. I just want you to guard your heart with all diligence so that the lies of the enemy will not come to reverse and undo in your heart the things that I have done. He's, that's not hard to do. Let me even put it this way. One of the things that the Lord showed to me was this. Nehemiah said that I, I have even appointed singers. The Lord Jesus has appointed singers in your heart that continue to sing of his praises. And all you have to do sometimes is just listen to what is in your heart as opposed to what is out there in the world. So today what we're going to do before we sit down is this. We're going to say, Lord, help me stand watch in my place as a member of the body of Christ. And also, help me stand watch over my own house. In Jesus' name. Let's be seated. We're going to get a little deeper into this, but before then... There's an exercise that I want us to perform very quickly. When Jesus was leaving, he knew very well that there was no way the disciples were going to make it. He just knew that they weren't going to make it. I mean, Jesus was crucified for three days. And in those three days, those guys were beyond defeated. In fact, even before Jesus was crucified, after a couple of hours of standing trial... His foremost disciple had already denied him. What am I talking about? Even while he was in the garden of Gethsemane. And he was praying for. He was praying about what was about to happen. He knew what was about to happen. He knew that he was about to be crucified. He said the son of man is going. As it's been written of him in the volume of the books and all of that stuff. Even at that particular point in time. He couldn't get any one of those men who had been with him for three years to pray for one hour. Now I'm gonna, I'll tell you a couple of things tonight that will make you feel good about yourself. Yeah, but don't get too comfortable because the Holy Spirit might flip the script. But when I read things like that sometimes, I'm just like, I'm not doing badly at all. Because these guys walked with Jesus for three years. And they knew that almost every night, Jesus would go to the mountain all by himself to pray. Do you know that there was no record of them trying to go with him and Jesus saying, no, 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 don't come with me. He was always saying, I'm going to the mountain. And they was like, yeah, we've had a long day. You go. It'd be a different thing if he was trying to go with... The one time that he went to the mountain and some of them came with him, he was the one who held them by the hand and said, you, Peter, James, John, 
you need to follow me. And there was no record that they were happy because we didn't see them saying, oh, blessed be the Lord who has found us worthy to go and watch with him all night on the mountain. Many of us aren't naturally excited about spiritual things. I mean, when was the last time, except you are rosemary, that you got so excited when the Lord calls you to fast? Yeah, my wife, my wife would be like, oh, I'm fasting today. And I'm like, I've never said that. <laughs> Not that way. When I'm fasting, you will know. I'd be like, oh, the Lord is actually um, leading me to, to fast. But what do you think? Do you think I should? Because I'm always looking for somebody to tell me not to. You understand what I mean? But my wife would be excited about it. But most of us, to be honest, when it's time to do engage in spiritual things, Especially when you're sleeping and you're enjoying your sleep. You just woke up from a dream wherein you were in a hotel in Dubai and they were bringing you room service and you were just having a great time. And then you wake up and the Lord is like, I want you to pray. And then you start to convince the Lord about the timing of that instruction saying, well, God, no one was chasing me in the dream. I was having a good time. I, I don't even think I need prayers right now. If anything, I just need to sleep some more. Because the Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Right? And so Jesus walked with this man, or this man walked with Jesus for three years. And when it comes to spiritual exercises, they always give Jesus the thumbs up. You go. Remember when Jesus met the woman by the well? Where were the disciples? They were busy hunting for food. They were at this particular drive through, and the queue was too long. They went to another one. And when they got there, they said they had run out of fries. They were spitting on the stone and, you know, that, that was what they were doing. They were looking for something for their belly, but Jesus was looking for souls. So Jesus was not particularly to be surprised by the attitude of those men or by their readiness. So he said to them, you can't make it without the Holy Spirit. Jesus told them, for your own sake. Don't even try to do too much. Wait until you have received power from on high. Now, you would expect that one of the first things Jesus would tell them about the Holy Spirit was that he was going to, he was going to make them walk on water. You would expect that Jesus would say, when you receive this Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, you will heal the sick and raise the dead. No. Jesus says, when you receive the Holy Spirit, he will bring to your remembrance the things that I have said. And many of you here know that I, have, I once preached a message titled, The Power of Remembrance. You see, because the world is in the state that it's in today because the fathers forgot what God has done. It's there, right there in Romans chapter 1 verse 26, that because the fathers have forgotten the knowledge of God, of God, the children have been giving up to a reprobate mind. So all the chaos that is going on in the world today. Every single thing that is happening in the world today can be attributed to lack of remembrance. You name it. Can we, can we talk about a couple of things that concern us as we're here? Lately, we've been seeing all kinds of craziness going on in the political arena. And politicians are self-seeking, seeking their own interests. They will sell anybody for money. All of these things are going on. And it's not just in this country. It's pretty much any country that is called a country. This craziness is going on. What does the Bible say? The Bible says a people that forget the Lord their God. Children shall be their princes. He says children shall be their princes. And you're like, well, we are seeing the opposite. Because old men seem to become our princes today. Yeah, but what happens to people when they become old? They start acting like children again. You understand what I mean? And so, even if you want to look at it in the natural, children have become the princes. Almost everywhere you go in the world now, they are look, there's one 80-year-old man that wants to be their president. And guess what? Apart from the ages of the people, the behavior of the people is no longer the behavior of an adult. Adults are stern, firm, resolute, and they're seeking to make sacrifices as opposed to just looking to run down the world and turn it into the most immoral that it's ever been. Why? Because the fathers forgot the Lord. Another place, the Bible says that a nation that does not remember their Redeemer, robbery will remain in their palaces. 
And that is the reason why there's so much mismanagement going on in the world today. You name it. And we're talking about children struggling with all kinds of habits today, struggling with depression and all, all whatnot. It's there because the fathers forgot the knowledge of God. And I'm not just talking about us. We just came on the scene. How long have, has it been since we got here? But we're talking about the people who for hundreds and hundreds of years repeatedly forgot the things that God said. And Jesus knew that I was going to become the number one problem with people. So that was the number one introduction. He says the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance. If only we can remember the things the Lord has done for us. You know, many of us were quick to remember how many times we have been hurt by people. We are always, we never forget the pain of the past. But if we can just apply that amazing memory of ours to the goodness of God. You know, David was always saying, forget not his benefits. Forget not his benefits. Do you know if we can what did God do for the children of Israel? Remember the story of when they went through the Red Sea. The Red Sea parted by the blast of God's nostrils. At the stretch of the rod of Moses, the Red Sea completely gave way. And the people walked on dry land. And if you know anything about seas and lakes, the bottom is never dry. Even when the water recedes in a drought, it's still very murky and very muddy. But God did it in such a way that every molecule of water that was at the bottom of that gave way. They walked on dry land. But God was watching them in that particular moment. And it's like, ah, these are human beings. And we know exactly what they do. By the time they get to that other side, give them about 21 days, they will forget. He says, so I want to help them Remember, so he said to them, hey, hey, slow down, slow down. Pick up 12 stones from the bottom of this place, one for each of the tribes. And when you cross over, set it up as a memorial so that you will remember that which the Lord your God has done for you today. That was the beginning of their salvation. Their salvation began with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is the ministry of remembrance. You see, because God knows that he is not going to part the Red Sea for you every single day. And he doesn't have to. Because if God is busy parting the sea for you every single day, then you don't have a life. Your life is a life of, it's like being in a cinema all day just watching a show. It's like God's about to do another trick. Watch. Ha, ha, ha. But when are you ever going to actually live as his agent on the earth if all you do is watch miracles all day long? So God knows he's not going to do that. That's not what it's about. He wants you to experience it and let it energize your faith. And whenever the chips are down, just bring out that which he has done. Many of us today, uh, let, me, let me put it this way, just the way the Holy Spirit showed it to me. He said to me that, Many of your brothers and sisters are sitting at the word, but they no longer recognize what it is. He says, and that's why I'm here, to remind them of what they're looking at. Do you know that a lot of the children that were born in the wilderness did not even know what the stones were for? After a while, you know what they started to do? They started to worship other people's stones because they're like, we have stones too. So when their neighbors were, were, were burning incense to stones and worshiping stones, they were like, yeah, we have stones too, so it must be all right to worship stones. If not, why are our fathers carrying these stones? They were sitting right next to the word of God that was there as a memorial and a tribute of the love and power of God, but they no longer recognized what it was. Do you know that one of the things that the Lord would have us do today is call on the Holy Spirit to remind us of the word that God has given to us that we have not tapped into. I can guarantee you that every single person in this place has a word from God. 
that is not yet reflecting in our lives. Every single one of us in here today, we have a sure word from God, a, a prophetic word from God. That we're not, if every single word that you have received from God is active in your life today, imagine what your life is going to be like. I mean, myself, I know that if I'm already walking in the fullness of all the things that God has said, if I, by now, maybe I will no longer be just walking, I probably will be flying everywhere that I go. You understand what I mean? And so, Jesus knew that the biggest problem is forgetfulness. The father knew that the greatest challenge they would have in the wilderness is forgetfulness. So he started them out on that journey by spelling out for them the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus did the same, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So the exercise that we would engage in today where you're seated is, you may have to close your eyes for this one because I find myself I, I'm able to shut of distractions more when I have my eyes closed. And just try, before you ask the Holy Spirit, try to remember. Try to remember the words, the things that God has said to you. Just try to remember what you may be missing. That word that God gave you you wrote it down, you recorded it on your phone, you told somebody. And now, ask the Holy Spirit. I said, Holy Spirit, I've thought about this, I've thought about that, but I don't even know. Which one would you have me remember in this moment? What is that word for now? The word that needs to become active now that I have received prior. That has been buried in my heart. That has been buried under seasons of disappointment. That has been buried under the rubble of failure. That has been buried. That needs to come up to do me good in this season. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is that he will bring to your remembrance all of the things that Jesus has said to you and then it will comfort you and it will teach you. So once you have that word brought to your remembrance, it will comfort you and then the Holy Spirit will teach you how to apply it. He will teach you what to do with it. He will teach you how to comfort others with it. You have treasures that you need to activate. There is no good. It is no good to you in the coming season for your gold to be in the ground. Let me say that again. It is no good for you in the next season for your gold to be in the ground. And that word that the Lord has given to you is gold. So by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, let it come up today. Let it come forth. I am eager to prophesy. I am eager to give a word. But the Lord is saying today, no, let's excavate the ones that have been previously given, which have since been buried. Let it come up. Let it come up. And now we're going to break bread. So if Alan can just get the communion to everybody. You see, because breaking bread is a powerful tool. Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus is the word of God. And he says, as often as you have the opportunity, remember me. And how do you remember me? By the ministry of my Holy Spirit. But he also instituted the communion. He says, do this. So by the time you look at it, Thank you, Alan. What this does is that in the natural, we're demonstrating our confidence in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. When I do this, what I'm saying is, Holy Spirit, I want to engage you in a new way. I want to engage you in a deeper way. What is that word that you gave to me? 
What is that word of God that I have received that you need to keep your focus? The Bible says, let your focus be on things above and not on things beneath. Because God expects you to be driving and operating in the spirit realm. You are in this world, but you are not of this world. If you don't know how to settle scores in heaven, you would always be at a deficit here on earth. Now, Solomon in his wisdom, you know what he said? Out from it are the forces that govern life. So the things that govern life are not here. The Bible says the things that are seen are a function of the things that are unseen. So if you're struggling financially, the solution is not to work more. Let me say that again. When you're struggling financially, the solution is not to work more. The solution is to receive more. Now, let me say this. I don't have to work for what has already been given to me. I just need to receive it. But the world teaches you that you need to work more. Why would they say that? Because the more you work, the wealthier they get. I can't imagine anybody working and earning more than their employer. If you're earning more than the employer, it's a lie. I've seen employers say things like, oh, in fact, I, this last month I couldn't even draw a salary because, you know, cash flow was low, but we paid everybody. I'm like, indeed. Indeed. But in two months, when cash flow improves, you will back pay yourself with interest. And then when no one is watching, you will sell the company and make all that profit. And then those people will start looking for new jobs. But people will tell you things like that to make you feel like they care about you. But nobody cares about you more than God cares about you. So people will encourage you to work more because he pays them for you to work more. Employers especially, they want you to work more because the more you work, the less you think about owning your own. The less you think about breaking out of the system. And when you look at the way the things run in this world, isn't it interesting that the more you earn, the more you are taxed? <laughs> you see, but let me tell you something. The opposite is what happens in the realm of the spirit. In the kingdom of God, the more you receive, the less you pay. Jesus said it. He says to him who has more will be given. But in the world, to him who has more shall be taken. So the reason why you need to participate in heavenly things is because everything that happens here on earth is governed in the realm of the spirit. So you need friends in high places. And you already have friends in high places, but you don't check on them. You don't spend time in the realm of the spirit. They don't even, they don't even remember you. Sometimes some of you, when you're really desperate, because something is going on with your kid and you don't know what to do. Then you go to God and you start to hold on to the horns of the altar. And you be praying and scabashing and then fasting and doing all of those things. And the angels are like, you know that one? They're like, yeah, it kind of looks like Jesus, but we, we, we don't know him. Let me tell you something. If they deny you in the realm of the spirit, it's a serious problem. Remember the seven sons of Sceva? They were trying to cast out demons. And the demons was like, they were like, wait a minute, who are you? They said, Jesus, we know. Because every night, all night, he's praying. We know Jesus. Paul, we know. Because we know that Paul has given up all of these cares of this world. And he's gone after the Savior. And he would never let the Holy Spirit rest. 
This was the way Paul lived his entire life. Paul was always following the Holy Spirit. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. He wanted to just know more and more of the Holy Spirit. This was after he was prophesying. This was after he had been to heaven. He still wanted, he never let the Holy Spirit rest for a moment. So they were like, Jesus, we know Paul, we know. They said, but we don't know you guys. And if, you, if they don't know you, they're not going to give up what is in your name. No. And I'm not talking about demons. I'm not talking about evil spirits. I'm talking about principalities and powers. Because you know that when we talk about principalities and powers, they taught us that principalities and powers are to be fought all the time. You should, you, you should, you should cast them out. You should bind them. When I'm like, where is it in the Bible? Wherein it says, bind principalities and powers. When Jesus was raised from the dead, what, did God, what, what, what office, what, what portfolio did God give to him? The father says, now you have become the head of principalities and powers. <laughs> it's, that's what's in your Bible. That Jesus is the head of principalities and powers. That is the reason why the Bible says, don't speak evil of dignitaries, heavenly dignitaries. No, I, 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 yeah, there's still a little one in there, thank you. I think that's just a reminder that I need to, I need to wrap it up. Say that again. Say that again. Five second rule. Yeah, my, don't worry, you can eat it on my behalf. I'll eat it from you later. Oh, in case you don't know, that's my wife, okay? So it's okay, I can go eat it later. But I, I, need, I need for us to get this thing. You see, the principalities and powers were put in place by God as custodians. So whenever you're about to take something that they've been watching over, they will say, no, you can't take that. What authority do you have to take that? Can I give you two examples? One of my favorite examples is when Gabriel, the archangel of the Lord, went to retrieve. When Michael the archangel of the Lord went to retrieve the body of Moses. Michael, from what we know, is the strongest angel in heaven. He was the one who got up and drove Satan and a third of the angels out of heaven. You know, they were messing about. They had a conspiracy going on. And what did the Bible say? The Bible says, and Michael got up and he drove them out. Now imagine an angel that can drive out a third of the angels. He's probably not the guy that you want to offend. You want to be his friends. When you play chess with Michael, you want him to win. When you toss a coin with him, whatever he says, that's what it is. This same Michael came to retrieve the body of Moses from Mount Nebo. Because remember that when, when Moses died, he was literally, God kind of put him to sleep. Because Moses had gone beyond wherein he could just die. The Bible says by the time he was 120 years old, his frame was like that of a young man. He was not bent over. He wasn't using the walking stick. At 120, his, his eyes were glowing. He had to wear a veil. And at 120, he had 20, 20 vision. The Bible says his eyes were not dim. He had become superhuman while he was still alive. Because the guy never left God's presence. He was always in God's presence to the point wherein he lost all of his immortality. He lost most of his mortality. He was gone. And so God had to march him up to the mountain to put him to sleep. Because he couldn't just die anymore, but his assignment was over. And so God kept him there and then sent Michael to come and pick him up. Because I, can't, I just can't imagine the father carrying a body. So he sent one of his boys to come and get Moses. And the Bible says that when Michael got there to retrieve Moses, because the Mount of Nebo was one of the mountains that Satan was administering. You know that Satan, when Jesus came, he told Jesus, he says, you see all those kingdoms, all those hills that you're seeing? He says, I'm the one running the show here. And Jesus did, like I told you on Saturday, Jesus did not deny him the claim. He just told him, stop being boastful, worship the Lord your God. Okay, there's a difference between shutting down someone's claim and just plainly ignoring it. Okay, so this is what happened to Michael when Satan accosted him. You can read about this in the book of Jude. Even I believe the details is somewhere in the book of Yasha, which most of us don't care to read. But in Jude, you have a summary of it. Jude said, Michael looked at Satan and said, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. 
And the reason why Jude recited that example, he said because you don't speak evil of dignitaries. You let them run their show. You do your own. Michael had to consult and what? And evoke God's authority. And then Satan was like, okay, well, if you bring the big man into the picture, you can go. You understand what I mean? And Satan let him go. When Daniel prayed, for 21 days his prayer was read. God says, the moment Daniel prayed, I said, I, I answered his prayer. I even sent one of my angels, one of my trusted angels, to take the blessing to him. But the prince of Persia, who was a principality over the region, he was like, there's no way I'm going to let Daniel get all that power because he's going to change the landscape. So the prince of Persia refused to allow the angel of the Lord to deliver the blessing. And for 21 days, they were in a duel. And after a while, the angel was like, man, I need to phone home. So he called home. And another bigger angel came. And he was like, come on, dude. Daniel needs this stuff. So they evoked an authority that was higher. Now, the reason why I'm taking my time to tell you all of that is because you have higher authority that is available to you but you're not using it. And one of the ways by which you can use that authority is to be, is to first of all, remember. I'm not saying learn. I'm saying remember. The reason why I'm saying remember is this, Candice, the Bible says that God has written all of eternity into your heart. So you know the names of all the angels. You know the names and the designation of all principalities and powers. Because they are part of eternity. Everything is on the inside of you. So you don't have to go to school to learn it. You just need to ask the Holy Spirit to remind you. And what you have is what you give. So the moment you have remembrance, you can then offer remembrance to those principalities and powers. And then you can say to the principalities, remember Jesus died for me. And he gave me all things. So what are you still doing here? This is my, the, Jesus gave this to me. He says he has given to me the, the earth for my inheritance. And so if there's any portion of this existence that I desire that is not yet mine, all I need to do is just remind the principality that is sitting over it that, look, Jesus paid for this in my name. Look at the record. And once I can remind them, guess what? They would let me have my way. Let us now read Nehemiah 2.7 again and it's going to make sense to you. The Bible says, Furthermore, Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 7, Furthermore, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. Judah means praise. So all of the things that are keeping me from being joyful all the time, from praising God all the time, is in the hand of some governors. And all I need is not to fight them with a the sword. I just need to show them a letter. Say, look, the king already gave me the region beyond the river. You may be the governor. You are only a custodian. I am the owner. So thank you for your service. You may now go. He says letter. Now let me tell you something. If a letter can be this powerful. We know the order of things in the kingdom, right? The Bible says the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. If a letter can bring you to Judah, then what? how much more when you have the spirit? So when you take a letter, they can see the letter and say, okay, you may go. But when you show up and the Holy Spirit is with you, the one who was there when everything happened, they cannot deny you because the Holy Spirit is going to give them the look. This is the reason why we need the Holy Spirit and we need to remember. It's simply because the moment you remember, what is the prayer that we say here when we're breaking bread? We will say, Lord, you said in your word, do this in remembrance of me. It's not just so that Manalita can remember. Jesus is not saying, do this so that you can remember me. He says, no, do this in remembrance of me. It is a general remembrance letter. 
So that principalities can remember that Jesus already paid for my health. So that every tissue in my body, do you know that every cell in your body was made from the dust of the earth? Because the Bible says, dust are you and to dust shall you return. And so if every dust, every, everything in your body is made from the dust, that means the blood that flows in your veins has ears. No, the Bible says kind begets kind. And the earth hears the voice of God. The Bible says, oh earth, earth, hear you the voice of of the Lord. So everything in your body can hear the voice of God. If your heart is beating too fast, you can tell it to slow down because it has to hear the voice of God. I remember one day my blood pressure shot through the roof because of some investments that wasn't going as I wanted. And the man of God said I had to kind of like semi-worry. And my blood pressure went through the roof, but I didn't tell my wife because I'm like, it's better for one to die than for all to die. It's better for me to worry than for all of us to not worry. So I kept it to myself and my blood pressure was going up. And you know what my wife said to me when she saw the blood pressure? She was like, it will come down and I speak to it to come down. Simply because it's from the earth. The only things that I don't try to speak to just casually are things that I don't know the origin of. But if I can tell that that thing was once from the earth, I learned this secret. My pastor, when I was growing up, he had an old beat up car and he refused to buy another one. He had money to buy another one, but it was like, this car is so faithful. I don't want to let go of it. And one day the car refused to be faithful. He said when he opened the bonnet, which is you call the hood, he said they looked at it and it just occurred to him that everything was metal and rubber. He says all of these things have come from the earth. He says, so hear me now because you are from the earth. I need you to take me home. He said, I'm not a mechanic. I don't know what to do. I shot the, As soon as he gave that testimony, and I knew that he got home that day, he did something to my spirit. And I hope that he does the same to you today. That from now on, you will begin to speak to things by the authority that you have in Christ Jesus. So Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Which means I can bring anything to remembrance. So if there's infirmity in my body, I can say, do you not remember that the Bible says by his stripes? I am healed. I believe that was what Isaiah said. But Peter said, by his stripes, I was healed. It has already happened. Let me, let me remind you something that I taught you all before about the power of remembrance. If you can master the power of remembrance, it's over. Simply because everything that God will do for you, he has already done it. The Bible says, by his word, all things were made. And he gave his word and his word healed them. And where is that word of God today? The Bible says, forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled. Jesus is retired. He's just chilling in heaven. And so if everything has already been done, I just have to remember. Nehemiah took letters and the governors allowed him to get to his place of peace. He had, the governors allowed him to get to Judah. I want to get to my praise. I want to get to a place where I'm just praising God every single day. But between me and Judah, there are governors who have forgotten that I have the papers to Judah. And I just have to remind them. So today as you break bread, Jesus was the one that gave us this secret. He gave us this insight. He said, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. So what is that thing that has been denied you today? Is it that your children are not listening to you? Do you know that there is a scripture for that? The Bible says, if I am your father, where is my fear? There is a holy fear that should be in the heart of... I'm not talking about the fact that they're afraid because you traumatize them. I'm talking about the fact that all you need to do is just speak what your heart desire is and your children will not know exactly what happened to them. They will just get up and start to do what you say. Whatever it is, it just needs to be brought to remembrance. That industry that you're looking to get into needs to be brought into remembrance that, hey, don't call me a newbie. I'm not a newbie. I've been here for as long as God's been here because I'm not here alone I'm coming in the name of God 
You know, the Bible says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And, and uh, maybe that's a word for you, Anita, because I know that you're just stepping into the real estate industry. So this is free advertisement. You come and see me later. But what happens is sometimes we go into something new. We move into a new territory and we think of ourselves as newbies. No, 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 no. I've been here as long as God has been. Why? Because I am coming in his name. And when God shows up in the place, do you know what happens? Even before he shows up, angels go ahead of him and tell whatever is on the way that for your own good, you better get up. The Bible says, lift up your head, O you gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and let the king of glory come in. You know why? Because the king of glory, the Bible says, is an all-consuming fire. If you don't open up, he'll consume you. So for your own sake, open up to me. Because I am coming in the company of the king of glory. This is the body of Jesus. If you are new and you're afraid, if you're new to this and those guys watching online, they're like, these guys are so confident. Yes, we are confident when we do things the way Jesus did it. Jesus took the bread. He didn't say, let's pretend that this is my body. No, he just took it up and he says, this is my body. And so the way he said it is the way we say it here too. He took the bread and he says, this is my body. He took the wine and he says, this is my blood. So we are only speaking what he spoke. And we're saying this is the body of Jesus. That was broken for me. As I eat of it today. And as I drink of this blood. In remembrance of him. Let the forces that govern life be brought to remembrance of who I am in Christ Jesus. Of all the things that he's already paid for in my name so that I can get to my praise. I can get to my plenty. I can get to my joy. I can get to my peace. Hallelujah. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus' name. We do so in remembrance of him. Praise the Lord. Let's just be seated for one minute and we're just going to wrap up. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay, there's another exercise that we're going to perform. John, stay for two minutes. You can't miss this exercise. The Bible says in Psalms 66 verse 1, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. In Psalms 81 verse 1, he says what? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Psalms 100, he says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And I'm like, God keeps inspiring David to share with us the secret of giving a joyful shout unto the Lord. Let me tell you something. There is power in a joyful noise. You know us, our communion house, when worship is on, wah, woo! That's because we know what we're doing. So today, (laughs) we will make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Anybody ready? Let's, let's, let's borrow Emmanuel for a moment. Emmanuel, do you mind going on the drums for just a few seconds? If it's going to work, because I don't know if they have to turn it on there. Does it work? Please, I want you to make a joyful noise. Play like you don't know how to play. Let it be a joyful noise. I want us to rise up from wherever we're at and say, Lord, in obedience to your word, and by faith and in anticipation of goodness and greatness, we give a shout to your name today. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Come on. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
Hey. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just to help your faith a little bit, let me tell you what I saw. I saw a huge glass tube that goes this way. And I heard that a siphon has begun. So what God is doing is the things that you have left behind, the goodness that you have left behind, the opportunities that you have missed, the things that the enemy took from you while you were ignorant, while you were not, not knowledgeable, the Lord is causing for those things to be brought forth. Because remembrance in the realm of the spirit, it looks like return and re replenishing in the natural. So that first shout, praise the Lord was for the things that you have left in the past. The next one. Uh, let me just quickly f give you a filler between the first and the next one. We're going to shout some more hallelujahs. Okay. Alrighty. So the next one. Look at, look at what the Bible says here. Matthew chapter 1 verse 7. Oh, I've been eager to share this with you for a long, long time. Now, Matthew chapter 1 verse 7. What, is, what does it say? It says, Solomon begot Rehoboam. Re 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 Rehoboam Begot Abijah. Abijah begot Asa. You see, we attribute Solomon to the wisdom of God. Right? Asa means the healer. Let me tell you something. The word of God is transforming itself. The wisdom of God is evolving within you to ultimately become your healing but now let me tell you what happens <laughs> Asa was not born right after Solomon Solomon begat Rehoboam and every time a child is to be born somebody has to shout Amen. the Bible says that as soon as Zion traveled she brought forth so between the wisdom of God between the promise of God and the healing there were several shouts you need to shout to bring forth so you want your healing God has given you his word but you want that healing we need to do some more shouting anybody ready Emmanuel hit the drums praise the Lord hey Praise the Lord. Let's be seated. Hallelujah. God is good. Hallelujah. Let's be seated. Praise the Lord. My lady, you know, stay alive. My lady, you know, stay
Alleluia. Mambele de si. Mambele de si tu rianda barakodo su sandele de rika da mousa. Oh! Alleluia. So I want you to I want you I want you to take this principle with you. I want you to take this principle with you that a lot of what the world recommends is to keep you in the dark. You see the world always recommends that we're always well behaved and quiet and and and, and composed and gentlemanly. Where does that get us? It keeps us bound. But the word of God says make a joyful noise. Let me say this. You may not have felt it. I know some people felt already certain things broken. But even if you have not felt it, <laughs> just know that this shout is not for... <laughs> it's not for nothing. It is for victory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Because, you know, many of us, we've been pregnant for so long. And it is time for us to birth stuff. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. See you Saturday. Bye.